Right, what's going on guys? Welcome to the video. So we're going to look at Friday's Newsnight program that was discussing what will happen in the next few months with Boris Johnson as leader. On the show was the former advisor to Nick Clegg, Polly McKenzie, Brexiteer Tom Harwood, who is a reporter from Guido Forks, Mita Fambula, chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, and Helen Thomas, former advisor to George Osborne. So equality is definitely the theme of this panel. Let's check it out. Well, I'm joined in the studio now by Polly McKenzie, chief executive of Demos and former advisor to Nick Clegg, Tom Harwood, who's a reporter for Guido Fox, Miata Fanbula, the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, and Helen Thomas, a former advisor to George Osborne. And we've got the news board, the news night whiteboard here. So before we discuss the impact of the new prime minister in the next few months, let's get our panel to make their prediction for the weeks ahead. They've all said that they think that Boris Johnson is going to win the election, so for the sake of this discussion, let's assume that's going to be the case. But what then happens next? You tell us what your predictions are likely to be for the next few days, because it's going to be a crucial few weeks when, uh, as soon as the new Prime Minister enters number 10. Right, so Boris uh, ends up in number 10. Uh, he totals off to Europe to renegotiate. Uh, but because he's not willing to do anything sensible, like offer EEA membership or a Norway deal, he gets absolutely nothing because of Theresa May's red lines. So he uh, faces a no-confidence vote. There's enough Conservatives who said they won't back uh, a, a, a party that is explicitly in favour of no deal. Um, the no-confidence vote wins, and the, in pity, the European Union grants us an extension, during which we have a general election. The general election... All four of the big parties win 150 MPs. We end up with a hung parliament that can't decide anything and make absolutely no progress at all. All right. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's one cheery view. Um, yes, uh, uh, Tom, do you tell us what you think is going to happen? Right. I'm going to peddle some more optimism in mine, in the infamous words of Jeremy Hunt. Um, Boris wins. We attempt a renegotiation with Europe. Initially, they say no, but because we're leaving no deal on the table as that credible threat, eventually, at the last possible minute, some concessions are granted, particularly around the Irish backstop. And that leads to a new deal being presented to Parliament, which, with the help of about 30 Labour, not quite rebels, but people supporting that vote, and the 10 crucial DUP MPs, the new deal passes. So we leave the European Union on the 31st of October. And then Prime Minister Boris Johnson is, is governing the country, but at this point he has a majority, a working majority in the House of Commons of just three MPs. Governing becomes almost impossible. He calls a general election and delivers as the first decent Tory majority since 1987. That's one view, but uh, we've, got, we've got two more counter scenarios to go. Who's next? OK. Miata, you tell us how you think it's going to play out. So, we'll have Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He will try and renegotiate a deal with Europe, but because he's boxed himself in by saying he won't accept a backstop and the EU won't budge, he'll fail. We'll be staring down the barrel of a no deal. And in that scenario, Parliament will try and stop a no-deal through a vote of no confidence. The vote of no confidence, however, will fail because when confronted with the reality of bringing down their own government and the political ramifications of that, Tory rebels will choose to back their government. But on the condition that the government puts forward a second referendum, we'll see an extension of Article 50. We'll have a second referendum in which no deal or remain will be on the ballot box with Boris Johnson campaigning for no deal and the Labour Party campaigning for a second referendum. And when confronted with those two choices, the country will opt to remain. OK, so co co complete odds with what Tom told us. Helen, you lay out your scenario for us and, uh, and then we're going to compare all of them and see if we can work out what the next three months might really hold. So, yes, Boris off to Brussels. Uh, renegotiation is, of course, the consummate salesman. So whatever he manages to thrash out, he will claim it is a new form of the deal. But it will all hinge on this Irish backstop and it probably will just be cosmetic. Uh, so he gets his renegotiation, comes back to Parliament, puts a new deal in front of them. But it won't still quite be enough, particularly for the DUP. That doesn't pass. So now what happens is we tick forwards with the clock towards no deal, there'll have to be a no confidence vote. But 
We will see the whites of the eyes of the Conservative Party in terms of uh, whether they're prepared to actually usher in a possible Corbyn government, and so that won't pass. And then there we are, with just probably days to go until the deadline. There is no way to stop no deal without passing a deal or revoking Article 50, neither of which will look um, palatable. So, no deal it is. We leave October 31st, whatever happens. Helen, thank you very much for that. So let's unpack some of that. So, so first up, we had to listen to the Ramonian liberal undemocratic spunk trumpet who dreams of a hung parliament where her party might have some relevance because it will never be anything more than a protest vote. We do see the usual defeatism from the anti-democrat lunatics, though, who want a second referendum. I'm shocked you didn't add a second referendum to the board, to be honest with you. Next up, we had the Brexiteer Tom Harwood, who mocks these pessimistic Ramonian fuck pigs by saying he's going to peddle some optimism. I don't think the dozy bints on the panel even realised it was a little dig at them, though. While I agree with what he said is likely to happen, I don't consider it to be a good thing like he does. Yes, Boris will go to the EU and get some concessions, but the deal will still be just a rehashed Maybot deal, keeping us tied to the EU for a set period of time and making us pay them money. So he is right that we will leave, and a general election against Corbyn, the Tory party, will destroy Labour, but the deal we are likely to get is not going to be the Brexit that everyone voted for. We all know we can't trust any of the MPs at the moment. Look at the last three years. Next up, we had the Ramonian woman from the New Economics Foundation, who is clearly a fan of a second referendum with the option to remain, as shown in her predictions, which are more likely what she actually wants rather than predictions of what she thinks will happen. We all know how reliable economists are. Remember the one the BBC got on the politics live show I covered, who didn't even know that the UK was the recipient of more international investments than anywhere else in the world last year. Economists say what suits their ideology, not what will actually happen. She actually says the country will opt to remain. Well, I'm sorry you dopey commie cum bucket. You can't have another referendum until the first vote is actually honoured. Any trust in politics would be gone after that if they tried to put out a second referendum. It finishes up with Helen thinking we will leave on no deal after a failed no confidence vote, and I would agree to a point, but I should say this prediction is being extremely optimistic to say the least. It would require Boris having the balls of steel, which I have my doubts about, even though I'm hopeful he will back up his words with actions. So let's move on to the next clip. Obviously, you all agree what is going to happen is that um, if Boris Johnson's the Prime Minister, he'll have to go back to Brussels and try and renegotiate something that the EU have been very clear is not up for renegotiation. Certainly, the withdrawal agreement, they say, cannot be reopened. They'll talk about the political declaration. Tom, why do you think they're going to change their mind and why would they offer Boris Johnson something that they didn't offer Theresa May? Of course, at this stage, they'd say that they're not going to open anything up. They've got a deal that suits them very nicely. It's why it's been rejected three times in our parliament. It's heavily in favour of the European Union and not very good for our country. The European Union, although, although that, all that's true, the European Union does not want no deal. It would be really challenging for Ireland. 60% of Ireland's trade is reliant on the UK. It would be really challenging for countries like Germany that are teetering on the brink of recession right okay, now. But even if they you they do to avoid open that. the withdrawal agreement, what on earth could they agree on the Irish backstop that, uh, that wasn't agreed before? Well, there are lots of things that weren't even asked for by Theresa May. She didn't go into these negotiations with the same spirit of saying, we are going to go for no deal. She didn't believe in no deal. She didn't believe in her own slogans. Having that um, having having a prime minister who is able to say, we are leaving deal or no deal, gives a new impetus to those talks. The Europeans are probably going to say something along the lines of, we'll give you a time limit on the backstop. We're going to change this in a way that we're going to work positively towards okay. alternative arrangements. That could be sellable. Miata, you don't think a scenario like this can come about. Why are you so sure that he will fail in a renegotiation? Well, because I think he's boxed himself in. I think by being so bullish about the fact that he will leave on the 31st of October, do or die, I think the fact that he's basically said he won't accept the backstop means he has so little room to, to manoeuvre. So, in the end, the backstop will have to be dealt with in some way. 
He won't be able to sell it in Parliament. He won't be able to sell it to his own side. The EU are not going to budge on it because in the end, it's their insurance policy. There will be talk of alternative arrangements. We've saw it, seen the working group of an alternative arrangement. For the EU, they will say, great, you've got an alternative arrangement. You don't need to be scared of the backstop. It's an insurance policy. But because of your alternative arrangements, we know we'll negotiate something. Let's crack on, to which he won't be able to get his side to agree to. And so in the end, we will have the impasse that we've had for the last... Yeah. Ah, but the key thing you said there was, will he be able to sell it? And that could very well be the difference, isn't it? That Boris Johnson can sell to the hard Brexiteers, to the European Research Group and some others, something that maybe isn't that different from Theresa May's deal, but because it's him, he can get it through. I think that is possible. And some people have been looking for a ladder to climb down, and he will at least provide them with that. Um, the toughest sticking point, as I mentioned, is still the DUP. However, um, we do have, you know, potentially there's even 26 Labour rebels who've signed this letter to, to, to their leader. And, of course, party discipline's broken down across the board. You know, we really have to go in and look at what is each individual's uh, MP's calculation. I, I, I like to say that, you know, the parliamentary arithmetic hasn't changed, but the individual calculation has. Having said that, it's still going to be uh, very difficult for the consummate salesman to get it done. And, Polly, you don't think he can come up with something that's saleable? Uh, no, and I think it's because the European Union fundamentally values its rules-based system and approach. Uh, they had that uh, PowerPoint presentation that they sort of set out, that looked at the red lines Theresa May had set out uh, and said, well, if you want to satisfy all of those red lines, then the only option that's available to you is basically Canada. Uh, and our view, uh, as the United Kingdom, was that that wasn't good enough for our economy because it doesn't give us good enough access to, to the single market. Now, the problem is we assume that the European Union is going to rewrite its rules for us because we're leaving. And, and I find it sort of unfathomable that the Tory Brexiteers, who believe that sovereignty, a rules-based system, is more important than economics, can't understand that the Europeans think exactly the same, that their rules, their sovereignty, is more important than economics, and they will suck up the pain of a no deal. They are much, much more prepared than we are, even though, as Tom rightly says, they don't want it, but they will accept it, because protecting the European Union's integrity is, in their view, the most important ballast against the rise yeah. of uh, strongman politics from Putin. So the host asked the Brexiteer why the EU might offer Boris something different to what they have offered Theresa May before. Tom rightly points out that the EU won't admit to being open to changing things because the deal suits them. Unlike Theresa May, the EU knows how to keep a hardline stance in negotiations to get the best deal, which is the complete fucking obvious to what Maybot and her useless bunch of fuckpig negotiators who didn't even mention the possibility of no deal did. He goes on to point out what I have been saying for a long time. The media and politicians run around saying no deal will be terrible for the UK and a disaster and all this crap, when in actual fact there's a good possibility that a no deal Brexit will be more damaging to the EU, not only financially but politically. If we leave without a deal, then other countries could just say, you know what, fuck this undemocratic shit pit, we are leaving, and then the EU falls apart. Did you guys notice when he points out that Germany is on the brink of recession right now, the BBC host has to jump in and talk over him? Why don't you want the people to know the Bank of the EU is about to go up shit creek without a paddle? I guess that explains why the EU needs our 39 billion then. Tom says Maybot did not believe in a no-deal Brexit, forgetting of course she did not believe in any Brexit, and by the looks of it, her and a lot of her cabinet actively tried to stop Brexit happening altogether. She didn't plan for no deal because she didn't intend to get Brexit done at all. Helen points out what I've been saying for a while, we stand more chances of getting a rehashed Maybot deal but it won't be easy either way, and none of us even want that. This is the predicament we find ourselves in. Limited time, politicians and the media weakening our position before the negotiations have even started. We might need a general election before October just to have any chance of getting out of Europe without getting the Maybot deal forced upon us. Labour is in complete disarray, as Helen said, so now might be as good a time as any to get a Brexiteer majority in Parliament for either the Tory party led by Boris and Jacob Rees-Mogg or the like, or a Nigel Farage and, and the soy boy destroyer widdicombe led government taking us out of the EU. I mean, it could even end up being a Tory and Brexit party no-deal coalition government. I think it's the only way we will get a proper Brexit, given how against it Parliament actually is. Remember Dominic Grieve said on Newsnight the other day, the PM has to respect the wishes of Parliament. Not once did he mention respecting the wishes of the British public. A general election to drain the swamp of all these Ramonian fuckpigs like Grieve in Parliament might be the only way to get a real Brexit. 
The clip ends with the Lib Dem claiming the EU will suck up the consequences of a no deal, when we have already heard the German economy can't afford to suck it up. Let's be honest, without the UK's money, the EU is going to rely more and more on Germany. How long can Germany sustain that remains to be seen. So let's move on to the final clip. Now, Tom, of course, one of the things that will have changed is the character of the person there. And, and, and you think that that's going to change things for the better, that somebody who's going to go in with a more bombastic attitude. But this is not a details man. We know this because he can't even work out the details of um, how kippers are sold from the Isle of Man correctly and whether they're subject to EU regulations. He doesn't uh, know what uh, clauses of the GATT tre treaty he wants to use in order to try and trade with the EU. Uh, we've got a potential Iranian crisis coming up and we know he's put his foot in it before when it uh, comes to diplomatic relations with Iran. Is this really somebody who can move the dial in Brussels? It's precisely because he's unpredictable that he can move that dial. It's, it's the Nick Nixonian madman strategy. The, the Europeans, just like the Russians then, need to know that he would press the button. They need to think that he's erratic. They need to think that he would be willing to do anything to ensure no deal. And only then will they think, hang on, this is a real threat. This could happen. We don't want this to happen. And therefore, we're going to change our tack. Well, it's a real threat, but, you know, let's be clear, no deal would be an absolute disaster for this country. It will be a disaster because it will be a hit to the economy. So, you know, the government's own watchdog has come out and, you know, you can shake your head and say these are fantasy numbers, but every credible economist will tell you that there will be a hit to the economy. But the we're office... talking here about what the new Prime Minister Johnson might do. He it's... doesn't believe that it would be a hit but to the economy, so he's but possible but he would do but it. But MPs do. And in the end, Brussels knows that we have a parliament that is sensible enough to look at the facts to look at the evidence, to look at the expertise and say, this is bad for our country, it is bad for the future of this country, we will not make this happen. And because they know they have that, they will stand there to the 11th hour, there will be an awful game of brinkmanship, awful b for both sides, quite frankly. But in the end, when confronted with that, we will blink. Our MPs will blink and they will force the government's hand. They can't. But it, but it can't be done without some kind of electoral event, do you think, whether it's a general election or a second referendum? Well, I just take on this, board, this point about the MPs. Something significant has changed since uh, March 31st passed without us leaving. As we saw in the European election results, there is now, as Polly mentioned, a, a four-party four-way tie, really, uh, which is pretty much unprecedented, not supposed to happen in our political system. Um, and if you think about how David Cameron was panicked by the rise of UKIP as the Tories dropped a few points to the 32% in the polls, how do you think the Conservative Party feels going from 40% to 28% in the polls? Because we passed through that date and we haven't left. So there is now an existential crisis uh, in, within the Conservative Party that uh, the MPs um, are going to have to address, which, although they may have a, an economic understanding, the, the political angle, you know, is potentially almost suicidal, uh, which they have to now confront, which I think is potentially will change people's calculations. And also means that Boris Johnson can be confident he would survive a vote of no confidence because Turkeys won't vote for Christmas, essentially. Tory MPs won't vote for a general election. Yeah, I, I think... The, the MPs do not want a general election, but there are enough MPs who would do anything to stop no deal and the economic catastrophe. And in the end, they might uh, trigger a general election rather than see that happen, uh, allow a vote of no confidence. The alternative is you have a vote of no confidence and then Parliament tries to install an alternative Prime Minister. And uh, even though uh, I kind of feels like a fantastic novel and people talk about, oh, you could sort of resurrect Ken Clark to be, uh, to be the Prime Minister or maybe Yvette Cooper. And uh, it's nice to play fantasy politics. I think that in the end just kind of is too impossible in our tribal political system. And a general election, which will solve nothing, will somehow be, uh, be pushed through nevertheless. OK, quick yes, no round. Will Boris Johnson still be Prime Minister this time next year? Helen? Yes. Yes. Yes, and with a majority. No. So the final clip started with the BBC host showing a clear bias against Boris Johnson, forgetting, of course, all the PMs before Boris had whole teams of staff working on the details. Take a look at all the MPs' expenses claims over the last few years, for instance. They all have been spending 200 odd grand a year on hiring staff to do the work for them. No one person is going to know everything required to run a fucking country, are they, you idiot? Tom rightly points out that Boris is not like your average PM. He is unpredictable and therefore the EU won't be able to read what he's going to do, which might give us some advantages over them. 
He compares him to Nixon, but I would compare him more to Donald Trump in the sense both are unpredictable and Boris at least talks the same sort of patriotism towards Brexit that Donald Trump has shown in his mission to defend the American border and build up the US economy. Hopefully Boris can imitate some of Trump's success. Tom rightly points out Boris needs to be prepared to do whatever it takes and the EU must know and fear that for us to get anywhere. If Boris turns out to be a limp dick, then we're fucked. Of course the Ramon in Spunk Trumpet can't wait to call a no-deal Brexit a disaster. Probably the same disaster that happened the day the UK voted to leave the EU in 2016. Oh yeah, it didn't happen, did it? Sorry, you fucking idiot. It's yet another imbecile spouting claims with no evidence to back it up. It's just their feelings on the subject and unbridled rage they feel at losing the 2016 referendum. She states every credible economist will tell you this when, as I said earlier, I think there are very few credible economists right now. The BBC definitely don't get credible ones on their shows, that's for sure. This woman is just another Ramona who uses the BBC to spread Project Fear nonsense the Remainers live on. Saying Brussels knows we have a parliamentary democracy that is sensible enough to know this is bad for our country. No, you idiot. The EU knows the shit weasels in Parliament are corrupt and looking to protect their own interests in Europe, so they run around screaming about how bad Brexit is and send complete drips like you onto BBC shows to spout their bullshit for them. Helen points out when the Tories are faced with their own political demise, they will ignore Project Fear and save their own asses, which is likely, with the exception of a few maybe. So as you will see there, that was a very unbiased panel. Four women versus the one lone guy, two Brexiteers against three, plenty of Project Fear bullshit being spouted as usual on the BBC, but what really annoyed me was, during the final clip, when that woman was spewing her nonsense about No Deal Brexit being a disaster, the host did not let Tom Harwood come in and refute the bullshit this so-called economist came out with. Instead, she moved on to the Ramonin Lib Dem bint, who just continued the bullshit. What a fucking surprise, eh? Now I'm going to end the video there, guys. Let me know what you think down in the comments section below, as always. I'm always interested to read what you got to say. Remember to leave a like, subscribe, and share this video, as it helps the channel a lot. And I'll see you all in the next one.